So when one speaks up for philosophy on the old internet, it usually doesn't take long for some science devotee to pop up and inform you of the futility of your efforts, usually because Pope Hawkins or the Archbishop of Kraus has decreed it so. If you're one of these philosophy denialist chaps, then you're about to be told why you're wrong. <laughs> The problem for those who would bury philosophy with a scientific spade is that science depends on philosophy. One cannot do science, at least not competently, without also doing philosophy. So no philosophy would also mean no worthwhile science. Here's the argument. Definitions. So my friend, where A is you, the philosophy denialist, the terminology in this video is as follows. Let P be the claim that you're doing empirical science, which means that you're in pursuit of trustworthy beliefs in a manner that rests, to some degree, on the perception of sensory phenomena. Let Q be the claim that you take certain terms to mean certain things rather than others, and that you value some things more than you do others. Let R be the claim that you've engaged in appropriate discourse. That is, that you yourself, or someone previously on your behalf, has engaged in rational, systematic and scholarly dispute. Dispute wherein all disputants have agreed to defer to cogent argument, and what methods and results will settle the matter, and that the ultimate goal is to learn rather than to teach. Let S be the claim that you're a conceited hypocrite, that is, you hold to your prejudicial beliefs more stubbornly than practicality dictates. Finally, let T be the claim that you're engaged in philosophy. That is, you're participating in dispute appropriate to the cultivation of wisdom. Deductions. There are nine lines in this argument, two assumptions, four premises, and three deductions the final of which is the conclusion. The first line assumes for the sake of the argument that you're doing, or at least are interested in doing, empirical science. The second line assumes, out of charitability, that you're not a conceited hypocrite. The third line proposes that it's impossible for you to do empirical science without taking conceptual and evaluative sides. This is because, as a competent empirical scientist, you must agree, even if only implicitly, with other competent scientists as to the meaning of the concepts and the superiority of the methods you cooperatively use in order to decide upon the best empirical theory. Which is why being stuck at home on their own, reading random conspiracy websites and making their own minds up as to what key terms mean and what counts as appropriate research, doesn't make someone a scientist. The fourth line proposes that it's impossible for you to take conceptual and evaluative sides and to eschew appropriate discourse without being a conceited hypocrite. This is because rejecting the use of rational, systematic and scholarly discourse on conceptual and evaluative issues invites the stubborn persistence of prejudicial belief beyond what practicality dictates. The fifth line proposes that it's impossible for you to take conceptual and evaluative sides and to engage in appropriate discourse whilst failing to engage in philosophy. This is because philosophy, as the cultivation of wisdom, requires all its practitioners to take sides, albeit provisionally sometimes, in rational, systematic and scholarly dispute. Which is why philosophy proper is distinct from the supposedly inspirational self-help nostrums that masquerade for it on popular forums. The sixth line proposes that you've either engaged in appropriate discourse or you haven't. This is derived from the basic principle that any statement is either true or false. The seventh line deduces that you're either a conceited hypocrite or you're doing philosophy. 
This follows from lines 4, 5 and 6. Because if taking conceptual and evaluative sides incompetently entails conceited hypocrisy, whilst doing it competently entails doing philosophy, then, given that you're either doing it competently or not, it follows that you're either a conceited hypocrite or that you're doing philosophy. The eighth line deduces that you're doing philosophy. This follows from lines 2 and 7. Line 7 claims that you're either a hypocrite or you're engaged in philosophy. At least one of these proposals must be true. Therefore, as we have already assumed in the second line that you're not a conceited hypocrite, the only remaining option is that you're engaged in philosophy. The ninth line, the conclusion, deduces that doing philosophy is necessary in order for you to do empirical science without being a conceited hypocrite. This follows from lines 1, 2, 3 and 8. Because if, in assuming as in line 1 that you're doing empirical science, you then find that you must, as in line 3, take conceptual and evaluative sides, then your only option in order to maintain the assumption from line 2 that you're not a conceited hypocrite is to accept from line 8 that you're doing philosophy. QED, philosophy, is necessary for good science. It seems then that if you want to advocate science whilst avoiding conceit and hypocrisy, you'll have to abandon your philosophy denialism. Now it ought to go without saying, although of course, alas, it doesn't, that in admitting philosophy, one is not thereby committed to putting a beard on a tautology, calling it daddy and eagerly awaiting its chastisement. God is no more necessary for philosophy than is owning a specially trained troupe of dancing ocelots. I hope that clears it up. Thank you for listening. Many thanks this month to my wonderful patrons. If you'd like to join this select band of people with excellent taste, then please check out the following Linky Dinky. Mm -hmm.